They wanted to win more than the other team. How many of us want to win? How many of us want to win somebody to Jesus Christ? How many of us believe what we preach? How many of us believe that this gospel is worth dying for? Somebody said, you can't begin to live until you find something that's worth dying for. God knows I wouldn't want to die without it. what God had planned for them. What was that? Get into Canaan land. Take a risk. Because there's not time to play it safe. If you're on the 55-yard line with a minute left, any of you that know anything about football, this is not the time to give it to the fullback and try to get three yards. <laughs> you got to improvise. You, 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 you got to do something. You got to take a risk. Put the ball in the air. And you know what's interesting? The fans in the stand know that too. It seems like many times the last one to know are the people in the pews, the people out here observing. They know what needs to be done. Here's a quote. One doesn't discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a very long period of time. We would have never made it this far had we not been willing to take a risk. The firefighter said, oh, I don't think very many people will move. We'll not sell the building. That was the first one. Second one it was, we'll not find a temporary place that we can afford. Third one was, oh, the building will be too expensive. And well, it was just all a bunch of high level bull because none of it was true. We'll talk about some of those victories in a minute. People that have this new mindset, this end zone offense mindset, they value time. Time is like money. The less you have of it to spare, the further we make it go. Fact, what you do with time will make your life more miserable or more enjoyable. And some of you have an enjoyable life and some of you are a little miserable because you've never really taken control to plan your time and God knows we can all do a better job in planning. And when it comes to the things of God, most people have this large concept of, man, I've got to give up everything to work 40 or 50 hours a week for the church. No! Just think what you could accomplish if you had one or two other blocks of time to volunteer, to reach out to others, to, to knock on the door, to send a, a track, to, to uh, pray for someone, to visit someone in the hospital, to attend a Bible study. Just think what you could accomplish for that. The next one is these focus upon their strength. They have a concentration that's so they can get the most out of the time that they have. You know, um, when it comes time down on the two-yard line and you got two minutes to go, everybody's position is important. True, you want to get it in the hand of Emmett Smith. He's the proven one that steps up to, the bat, uh, up to the plate. He's the one that needs to have the ball in his hands because he's the one that from time to time has broken it and brought the score and brought the victory. And everybody understands that. They understand he couldn't make it without tackles and guards and ends, people that would block. He understands without interference he couldn't do it. And everybody on the team understands that they must pull together regardless of what they're responsibility, regardless of what their gift is. It's important that the team be there 
knowing their responsibility, knowing their gifts, and all pulling together for one common goal. Let's get a touchdown. We come in to the sanctuary on Sunday morning. How many of us are praying, oh God, today just, just one soul, just one that's lost. Lord, give us that one lost soul. There's going to be one there today, Lord. I'm praying that uh, whatever Ben preaches today, you'll use him and bring the anointing power of God upon him that he can touch the heart of that individual. Yes, Lord, I'm praying that that one lost soul will be saved today. That's the desire and the goal and that's what we're here for. That's victory. Not one person, everybody. Two-minute mindset. This is where the important part of the game is played. Here's what I'm saying. When there's an intensity and focus on the end zone. The teams that get there the most often recognize the players that can get them there, and everybody else does their part to complement those players. Not territorial, not trying to protect their position. I want to carry the ball. You understand your role is to block. It's time for him to carry the ball. And everybody else does their part to complement those players. In other words, go with what gives you the greatest return. The thing that gives us the greatest return at Calvary Tabernacle? Sunday morning worship. Sunday morning worship is where we have the greatest opportunity to reach the most people to help affect change in their life, to introduce them to Jesus Christ, to do something good for eternity's sake. Is it asking too much that all of the team make an effort to be at every game? Because without every team player, there's a weak link. It's hard to do it. I can imagine uh, watching the Yankees in uh, Cleveland last night, I, uh, you realize the importance. Here's one little guy I didn't even know. I thought I knew all the Yankees, all the way back to Babe Ruth. Who's the first baseman for New York? Anybody know? He'd gone hitless, I think, in 19 or 20 times at the plate. He leads off the inning. Who is it? Tino Martinez, he's one of my favorite players. I know him well. He led off the inning, and he smashed a double down, smashed the ball down the left field line. Oh, man, the team is thrilled to death, and he immediately goes into second. First thing they do, Yankees are kind of afraid that the uh, Cleveland Indians, they have a lot of power. Man, they could come back. I think they had a three-run uh, lead at that point, but they wanted to get this run in. Tino Martinez is the leading, or is the first baseman. He's a starting player. He's been in the lineup every game. They took him out of the game and put in some little kid about my size, not quite as handsome, not quite as fast, but he was fast. They put him in to run at second base. Martinez camp, boy, you could see the team. They were giving him the high fives. They were thrilled for him. He had broken his slump. Here he is out of the game. And this guy, who I haven't even seen, he's out there on second base. He was able to score because of his speed and of his ability to run the bases. He didn't get the cheers when the home runs went up. He didn't even get credit for the base hit, but he's going to score and he's going to help the team defeat Cleveland to bring the series even. The team needs to be in place. The team needs to be ready to do their part because there's a lot at stake. And what's at stake is eternity for people. People with this new mindset, this gold line mindset, they move forward on character. Where is the character of the church today? When does the two-minute offense kick in? At the end of the first half? And at the end of the game, 
Now listen to this. Question. When are the players the most tired? At the end of the first half and at the end of the game. They've been on the field. They've been fighting. They've been struggling. They've been sweating. They've been doing everything they could possibly do. If ever there was a time they'd want to walk up to the coach and say, Coach, could I sit out for a while? They can't do it now. Do you get it? Their greatest progress is made when they're the most tired. Now when they're with two minutes left to go and they're down within the goal line, they need the best players. Because they're people of character, that's why they're able to do it. We sometimes wonder, why has this individual been able to withstand all of the, all of the storms of life? How has this individual been able to put up with all of the garbage that has been launched at him? But yet you can answer it when the chips are down. An individual of character. We, as Christians, are to be people of character. When the two minutes are, are, are when we're, we're with two minutes to go, regardless of how much work we've done, regardless of how much energy we've spent, regardless of how tired and fatigued we are, this is the time that we must step forward and say, yes, we're ready. This is our time to shine. This is our time to get the victory. How many times have you heard it said? I heard it said at the ball game last night. Northside was ahead 14 to nothing. Could have been 18 to nothing. They just was blowing Rockbridge off the map. The end, it will come to the end of the game, the score was 24 to 14, Rockbridge. And I heard someone make this statement at the game. They wanted to win, talking about Rockbridge, more than the other team. They wanted to win more than the other team. How many of us want to win? How many of us want to win somebody to Jesus Christ? How many of us believe what we preach? How many of us believe that this gospel is worth dying for? Somebody said, you can't begin to live until you find something that's worth dying for. God knows I wouldn't want to die without it. But God knows I would be willing to put my life on the line for my kids, for my family, even for my friends that may not know Jesus because we're not talking about just a little ball game. We're talking about eternity. If you could have been with me last Thursday night, and heard my daughter Heather talk about some of the children that's in her class. We were at Carlos. Any of you ever eaten at Carlos restaurant? It's one of the best Brazilian restaurants in town. There must have been 20 of us there. And she began to tell about three children in her class. She told about one little child who just loved her dearly that comes to school and has for the last week or so with chewing gum in her hair. Her mom and dad don't care enough about her to clean her up and get the chewing gum out, and she has lice. She loves Heather. She told another little story about one of the most beautiful children she'd ever seen who showed her how she'd been abused. She had to report him. And because she couldn't reach and get her book bag and kept asking one of her parents for help, she was beaten and had the, had the scars that were so bad. She told another story, and I didn't realize it, but she began to get cold, and she, Heather, and looked at me, and she says, I'm sorry, Dad. I didn't mean to make you cry. And then the tears just begin to trickle down my cheek. I couldn't believe that there would be children that could be abused in this town, in this valley. Could it be that 
we need to find some people who are willing to invest their lives into these children and put their life at risk to go and knock on the door and say, we'd like to carry your little child to church this coming Sunday. We'll take real good care of her. We'll feed her and we'll return her home at the proper time. We're missing it. Some of us are going to begin to see this as ministry. When the children come in, I, I had a great meeting this past Thursday. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that came out of the meeting was the importance of the nursery. And this pastor told me, he said, Ben, unless you have a, a much better equipped, said this is a beautiful facility and for what you have it's wonderful but it's, it's just not adequate enough you need six beds you need grandmother types that will hold the babies and love them pastor you're going to have to find people that are not going to rotate but that you're going to have to find people who are willing to invest their life into these children. I'm talking about a end zone mindset. The clock is ticking. We have two minutes. Our time has come. We're beginning to work on the plans. You saw this morning that uh, we, we need to, in our elders, we need to add an additional elder. We need to uh, make some changes with various aspects of the church. And by the glory of God and by your help and God's guidance and wisdom, we're going to do it and we're going to be prepared. And when friend day comes, friend day marks the beginning of something mighty and wonderful. Friend Day marks the opportunity for us to strip away all of our prejudice and, and sacrifice our time and pour ourselves into the people that are going to come. Yes, these that make changes. And when you think about them being down on the goal line, sometimes their changes are spontaneous. They set aside this plan they've been working on. I mean, they have been practicing. I've been told that Coach Dean Smith, when he was coaching uh, the University of North Carolina basketball, I've been told that he would spend the majority of his practice working on the last two minutes. He had it down to a science. This is the, where the games are won, the last two minutes. But you see, there comes a time. It's the last two minutes. You're down, and you might need to dump something that you've been doing all of your life because you identify, you recognize, you've got to do something spontaneous. The time is at hand, and you don't have time to have a board meeting. You've got to do it. The time is clicking. The game is on the line. We've got to be willing to move ahead and to be spontaneous and improvise with the idea of there's a lot at stake. Do you get what I'm saying? It's no accident that you get into the end zone. That's where we score and we celebrate. And teams with end zone mindsets, they get there. Teams with comfort zone mindsets, they never get there. With the grace of God, with His inspiration and guidance and direction, I want to see Calvary Tabernacle become an in-zone mindset, working with a two-minute game plan, anticipating at any moment the return of Jesus Christ. But we want to celebrate and obtain every victory that we possibly can before He returns. You could have the inability to see the score. Listen to this. I'm just about through. You could have the inability to see the score and go to the game and you could tell who's winning. You ever done that? 
All you have to do is watch the stands. On one side, people are jumping up and down, having a good time. They're laughing. They're talking. They're celebrating. Oh, man, this is the greatest game. Our team is the greatest on earth. On the other side, people are just sitting there. That's the losing side. They're talking about how bad the refs were. Do you see that call? Man, I'm blind, I'm deaf, I want to be a ref. I mean, they just, they don't have anything good to say about the referees. Everything is bad. They get upset, they get excited, they start screaming at the players. Get out there and do that. Get into the game. But we want to be the ones that talk about victories and celebrate. The children of Israel... They never made it. They never made it. I'm talking about the older generation into Canaan land. They had a good game plan. They weren't hungry enough for it. They weren't hungry enough for it. You get hungry enough for something, and you're going to get it. You get hungry enough for Texas Tavern Chili. You're going to get it, aren't you? You get hungry enough for things of God. You get hungry enough for a passionate, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. You get hungry enough, and I mean, you think about it, and you, you're starving for it, and it becomes a passion within you that burns. You're going to get it. And that's where I see us going. We're going to have that two-minute game plan. We're going to score some victories. But you know what? The greatest thing, we've already made some victories. Sold the church on Orange Avenue. What a victory. Man, nobody will buy this church. It's in a bad neighborhood. And if they buy it, they won't pay enough money for it. Hey, we sold it. Probably got more money from it than we should have. Sold the building next door. Don't finance it for them. They'll never pay you. We financed it, and they paid us. Man, that's a victory. Don't get in this little building here on Peters Creek Road. You can't afford to rent. It's $1,500 a month. Well, my Lord, how are we going to spend, how are we going to be able to afford the $15,000 a month when we move to something bigger and better? We have to dream and we have to anticipate. That was one of the greatest moves that Calvary ever made. That was a victory. You remember when we came in here the first day? Whew, my goodness, they were everywhere. I mean, there were so many people in the choir. They were breathing down my neck. It made my hair fall. Didn't have enough hairspray. I had hot breath. People were coming from everywhere. A victory. One lady said he'll never build that church. Well, I, and I didn't. God built it. And this isn't the church. This is phase one. But we can't be more interested in the building than we can the people. We have to keep our focus. Our plan is to minister to the people. And we've got to do ten times better job in the present than what we've done in the past. Are you hearing me? We must do a ten time better job in the present than what we've done in the past. And we'll be able to do it. Because I've never known Calvary Tabernacle not to answer the call. Never. I've been here ten years and I've never stepped up and asked anyone that they didn't answer the call. Oh, you always have a few flakes, but where one flake flakes out, there's two or three to take their place. We're going to have a victory here, celebration on November 1st. That's Friend Day. We're going to have a victory celebration. We want the building full. If you double yourself, There'll be more people than we have chairs for them. And won't that be wonderful? 
I'm going to turn Perry loose here and let him talk about Friend Day. But we need to be praying more than just a full house. We need to pray that the people that come that aren't saved will find God, first and foremost. Secondly, the people that come that are kind of like the children of Israel living in the desert, we want to take them from the desert, dry experience, and help lead them over into Canaan land, which is where God wanted them, the land that flows with milk and honey, where they can rejoice and celebrate. Will you do me a favor? And I'm going to stop with this. Will you do me a favor? And I want you to start at the next service. I want us to start learning to do something that we did previously. This will make a great statement for our church and to our visitors. And it will create for our visitors a great opportunity not to embarrass them. Starting almost immediately, when you come, I hope you can come every service. But when you come, I want you to sit as close to the front as you can. I want you to sit as close to the front as you can. When I went to West Virginia and held that citywide crusade at Beckley, I preached at all of the major, largest churches in the area. And the one large, everlasting impression that was made upon me, and I didn't realize it until I was in the car with Ken Taylor heading home, and I looked over at him. He was driving, of course. And I said, Ken, did you notice at that church what was different about that as opposed to the others? And he said, what? I said, they all sat from the front to the back. It tells the people that you're interested in the things of God. And it creates for the guests, not visitors, our guests a place where they can sit and not have to be put on display. The worst thing that can happen on Friend Day is they come in and they're forced to sit right here in the front and it kind of puts them in an uh, uncomfortable situation. Pray about that. And the Lord's going to tell you to do it. I've already talked to him about it. Then determine to follow what he tells you. A new mindset. The children of Israel didn't believe they didn't get in. Now later, Joshua and Caleb led the next generation in. But that other generation didn't get in because they had a comfort zone mindset. We need an in zone mindset. There's two minutes left to play. Let's get in and score, and then let's celebrate.